Emil Zola, Sex, Lovesick by Dan Rebellato. Please, somebody help me. My daughter. My girl. Help me. Where are you? Angelique. What will become of you? Is there anyone? Someone? My daughter. My sweet girl. Please. Somebody help me. At the end of my life, my body is weak, my memory tattered, but my dreams seem to be as strong as ever. There's a nurse here who thinks that dreams are a glimpse of the afterlife and that death is just a dream without end. She's a fool. And I have asked for her to be moved to another floor. Dreams are not heaven or hell. Girl? Dreams are not fantasies. Girl? Dreams are survival. Can you hear me? Of course I can hear you. I think she's waking up. Waking up? What are you talking about? Girl? Can you hear me? You say you're alive. Somebody save me. Should I keep talking to her? Certainly. Girl, you're alive. Girl, Dee Dee. The girl, this hardly living girl, is my great granddaughter. And my great-great-granddaughter. Oh, <laughs> it's a long story. She's a love child. At least it was a sort of love that produced her. A forbidden, shameful love. But love, nonetheless. Alive. Abandoned by my grandson, passed from one foster family to another, treated sometimes cruelly, sometimes brutally, until one winter, aged thirteen, she can take it no more and walks out into the snow. Twenty-five miles she walks through the night until she comes upon the town of Beaumont and collapses before the Cathedral of St. Agnes. As the freezing air bites into her, Help me. the last thing she sees is the face of the stone saint gazing piteously at her. Help me, Agnes. Sweet child, hush. You're safe now. This is Hubertine Dulac. The Dulacs have been loyal servants of the church for centuries, embroidering the chasubles and maniples, the mitres and dalmatics for the priests and bishops of St. Agnes. It was Hubertine who found the girl's frozen body in the snow, carried her home, and has spent the last several weeks nursing her back from the very edges of life. Where did you come from, child? I can't. I can't remember. Shh. It doesn't matter. Don't worry. We'll talk when you're better. The girl is not used to kindness, and it takes time to trust Hubertine. What's your name, child? My name is Hubertine. I have to call you something. Henry. I'll call you Henry. You can't call me Henry. Then what should I call you? Very well. Henry it is. Angelique. What was that? My name is Angelique. 
Well, I'm pleased to meet you, Angelique. The sound of her own name is unfamiliar to her. In 13 years, this is the first time anyone has used it. But Angelique is a weak child and her fight with death is not yet fully won. Who are you? My name is Dee Dee. How are you in my head? I didn't realize I needed permission. What's that sound? I don't know. Am I awake or am I dreaming? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know much, Dee Dee. You're right. Oh, I'm going up again. Are you all right, Angelique? I... I think so. You were talking in your sleep. I was. You were. Can you hear that? I can't hear anything. It's the cathedral, breathing. Breathing? Yes. Listen. Buildings don't breathe, sweet child. Can't you hear it? You still have a fever. I'm all right. Who is Dee Dee? Dee Dee? Is she your mother? No. I see. While Angelique has been fighting for life, Hubertine has been diligently trying to trace Angelique's mother, sending and receiving letters that trace the sorry story of her young life. The next morning, she receives a letter from a farmer's wife in Soulange with an address where Angelique's mother might be found, and she sets off. This is Nurse Boulon. She see if you need anything. I'll be downstairs. Just ring this bell if you need me. What will I do? Oh, why don't you read something? Like what? Whatever you like. Just pick something. I don't want to read. Please yourself. I'll see you tomorrow, darling. Do I get a goodbye? Goodbye. Ring the bell if you need anything. Bye-bye. Young girls of Angelique's age are hungry for experience, for knowledge, for life. She reaches across to the pile of books on the table beside her bed and her fingers first touch a book called The Golden Legend. Curious, she traces the feel of the leather beneath her fingers, the indentations of the gold inlay. Turning the thick pages, at once her eyes are caught by the images. Saints and martyrs, hundreds of them. The first engraving depicted Saint Juliana, her young body tied to a wheel before a jeering crowd, her broken bones healed by an angel. The second engraving showed St. Christine, snakes coiled around her body, her young face serene and composed, a pagan temple crumbling to dust behind her. And when Angelique begins to read the words, She's dazzled by the tales of the early Christian martyrs, how they lived and how they died. They are accused of magic, of witchcraft. They are dragged to temples, kept in towers, thrown in dungeons. They are starved and they refuse food. Their bodies are smeared in honey and eaten by flies. Their flesh is torn by hooks and blades. Their wounds are filled with lime and boiling pitch and molten lead. They are made to wear burning crowns, to lie on white hot bronze. Their sides are burned with torches. Their legs are broken with metal. Tug out their eyes, pull out their tongues. Nothing affects them. It is the most exciting thing Angelique has ever heard. Her whole body responds to the suffering of the Christian martyrs. Each time she closes her eyes, her young mind is filled with agony and miracles.
You've come about my child. How is my boy? Where is he? No, madam. I know nothing of your son. I'm here about your daughter. This is Renee. My daughter? You did have a daughter. Poor Renee. I had a boy. I don't know Maxine. about that. Maxine? Have you seen him? I haven't. How is he? I'm talking about Angelique. Your daughter. Angelique. Poor Renée fell in love with her stepson. Her husband, my grandson, punished her by sending her to the asylum of Les Tulettes. She was on the floor above me. I would hear her walking up and down, up and down. My daughter? That's right. <gasps> my girl. I want you to know that she's safe. I remember. She's safe and well, and she's happy. It was Aristide. You have to believe me. What? S sorry, what was Aristide? He made me send her away. I'm sure. How is she? Well, as I said, she's well and happy. Is she well? Yes. I mean, I... does she say things? Strange things? Oh, she's a girl. She says... Be careful of her. What? Let go of me. She's a Rougon. I don't know what you mean. They are dangerous. Let me go. All of them. Please. No one knows Please let go of my wrist. They take you. Help. And they Somebody destroy please. you. Sit. Renee, you're hurting me. I have to go. I just thought I'd come to you. If you see him, if you see Maxime... Tell him. I'm here, and I'm waiting. But she's right, Hubertine. The Rougons are dangerous to others and themselves. The next evening, Angelique is gazing down from her attic window into the cathedral grounds. The cathedral shrouds the gardens in deep shadow, but as she looks, she seems to see a shape, an outline. She looks closer, and she sees, yes, it's a man. A young man, by the willow. A young man with long, golden hair. And as her eyes get used to the dark, she starts to see his face, looking up at her window. You're up. I'm sorry. Oh, don't be sorry. I'm pleased. You are? I was beginning to think you'd never get out of that bed. What are you looking at? Nothing. Is there something down there? I told you. I hope you're not hiding something. N no. Uh, then let me pass. I see. There's nothing. <laughs> Just as you said. See? Why didn't you tell her about the boy you saw? I don't know. Don't know what? You need to get to bed. I'm not tired. You'll need a good night's sleep because tomorrow you have work to do. What sort of work? Embroidery. If you're up to it, that is. I don't know. We'll see how you feel in the morning. Good night, darling girl. Good night, Hubertine. The next morning, Hubertine introduces Angelique to the arts of embroidery. She shows her how the cloth is stretched across a frame, the wooden structure held in tension with metal braces, a series of four screws tightening the material until the surface of the fabric is taut and hard ready for the first needle to pierce it. Am I doing this right, Hubertine? Yes, darling. In fact, Angelique quickly proves herself a gifted and skillful embroideress. In her hands, the gold and silver told stories of an unusual vigour and subtlety. The symbols and flowers and animals that she wove came to mysterious life beneath her fingers. Hubertine would watch amazed as out of the simple threads a lily grew on the silk, its stem like a beam of golden light, its delicate leaves twirling around it like shooting stars. 
This is right, isn't it? Angelique, you have no idea. It's beautiful. Thank you, Hubertine. Angelique, you know... Yes, Hubertine? You can call me mother, you know. But I have a mother. Yes, of course. Not her. I mean Mary. Mother of Christ and mother of us all. Oh, I see. Angelique's talent was remarkable. Under her fingers, devotion and faith seemed to dance in the cloth, while her thoughts were of the invisible and the beyond, of the infinity of God's love and the golden legends of the saints. Do you like it, Mama? I do, Angelique. It's a kind of miracle. It's laundry day in Beaumont. Although there is a laundry with heated water in the new part of town, those living in the shadow of the cathedral prefer to wash their clothes in the Chevrot River. Once a month, the townspeople are permitted by the religious authorities to wash their clothes in its clear waters. Who's that? Wow. Up there, on the cathedral. Oh, that's Felician. Who is he? He's the bishop's son. What's he doing? He's mending the stained glass. That's what he does. How long has he been in Beaumont? Only a month, maybe two. He's been travelling. Why? Do you fancy him? Of course not. God, I do. Don't blaspheme. You what? Why don't you fancy him? I think he's bloody gorgeous. You should get on with your washing. Angelique continues with her work, just occasionally glancing up to take in the sight of the young man, suspended 50 feet above the ground in a rope and canvas harness, carefully placing a deep green panel of glass into the book of St. John the Apostle. John the Divine. John the Evangelist. Why is John? Perfect in the love of Christ. Angelique would grate soap into a pail of water, then press in a shirt and work it with her fists. Then she would beat the shirt against a rock, finally squeezing and rinsing it in the fast-flowing river. He's here. Angelique likes the feeling of the cool water flowing over her hands. He's here. Who's here? The boy. Look casual. The bishop's lad, Felicien, is taking a break from his work. Oh, my God. He's coming over. I told you not to blaspheme. Careful. Distracted, Angelique has let go of the cotton blouse she's holding, and it has begun to roll and oh, dance no. its way down the river. Someone grab it. The bishop's boy looks up takes in the situation and, without a thought, strips off his shirt and jumps into the water. Ah, oh, amazing. He grabs the shirt and swims strongly back upstream, heaving himself out of the water, presenting the errant blouse to Angelique. Uh, thank you, sir. The boy turns, picks his own shirt off the ground and goes to dry himself in the sun. You lucky cow. Don't be daft. You don't even like him. No, I don't. Oh, yes, she does. And who can blame her? Not me. But Angelique is afraid. Afraid of her feelings for the bishop's boy. Afraid because earthly love is a sin, is it not? And she has promised her heart to Christ. Help me, Lord. Give me the strength to love only you, my saviour. Above her, the cathedral, massive and hulking, seems to be at prayer. From the great west door, a sharp air enters the nave, and as it passes among the pillars and buttresses, through the aisles and arcades, 
Angelique can almost hear voices raised in song. Angelique looks up at the saints. The statue of Saint Catherine with her sword. Saint Mary of Egypt carved in relief above the pulpit. And at the center of the rose window, Saint Agnes. Her eye is caught by Saint Agnes in the window. And as she watches, the saint seems to... Here you are. Mama, I've been looking for you all over town. I just came here to pray. You might have told me. Have I been here long? Three hours. I must have lost track of time. You're feverish again, child. Your eyes are shining. I'm all right. You should see the nurse. I don't need a nurse. I'm just thinking. Have you ever been in love? In love? Why? Have you? Who's been talking to you? Nobody. Yes, I have. Many years ago. Who was it? When I was younger, my mother sent me to Charville to learn my craft. There was a man there, a stonemason. He was a kind man. And I think he loved me. You think? But my mother did not approve. She forbade me from marrying him. What did you do? I ignored her. You disobeyed your mother? I did. We found a priest to marry us. My mother said she never wanted to see me again. And did she? Only once more. Six months after the wedding, I found I was pregnant. I felt sure she'd want to know, and that she would soften. So I made the visit from Charville and came here to see her. Did she forgive you? No. She wouldn't let me into the house. And loud enough so that the town could hear, she cursed me and my husband and our baby and she sent me away. Mama. The baby was due in January. But when the day came, I tried to deny it, but I knew there was something wrong. The baby. Our baby baby was stillborn. It died? Nothing was the same after that. The stonemason and I fought all the time. Our love had died with our child. And one day, he walked out and never came back. You never heard from him again? No. And I don't want to. But you did love him. Understand something, Angelique. Love is an illusion. Love is a snare. Love ever dies. Love ends and it ends us. Promise me you will never love. I've given my heart to Christ, Mama. Good. He is the only man who won't let you down. That night, as she lies in bed, Reading her book of saints, Angelique vows to love only Christ. And for the next three weeks, she works with her needle, and she does not think of Felicien, the bishop's son. Every minute of every hour of every day. We have a visitor. Just a moment. What's the matter? Just a mistake. Love? It's nothing. You sewed the word love into the bishop's coat. I was distracted. Who is the visitor? The cathedral has a commission for us. Oh, yes? It's rather a big job, so I don't mind if you say no. I will speak with the bishop. It's not the bishop. He sent his boy. I'll go and get him. No. Do come in, Felicia. Mama. The boy hesitates into the room, looking at the floor. He holds out a piece of paper, on which is a design and a set of instructions. It's a mitre in shade of gold. It takes time. 
and the bishop wants it for the end of the month. The end of the month? For the procession of the miracle. That's impossible. That's what I said. The boy looks embarrassed and turns to go. Wait. It is a very graceful design. It would be a shame if we could not fulfill it. But shaded gold. You should understand, Felician, that shaded gold is a technique that few can master. I think my daughter may be the only one in France. I will do it. Are you sure, Angelique? Even if I have to stay up all night, every night. I'll show you out. As he turned to go, Felician raised his blue eyes to look at her. At that moment, Angelique saw something in his eyes. Something like love. Thank you, Angelique. But I hope you won't really need to stay up all night. If the bishop needs it, we are here to serve. The bishop has asked if Felician could come in to check the work. Whether he's here or not makes no difference to me. But bishop's boys with long golden hair make an awful difference, don't they, Angelique? Are you talking to me? Of course I am. Well, I wish you wouldn't. I'm trying to pray. A <laughs> lot of good that'll do you. Oh, I understand now. You're a devil. You wouldn't be the first to say that, but no, I am not a devil. The high cathedral vault sighs above her. The thick columns pulse around her. Angelique lays her body on the cool stone and begs Christ for guidance. Help me, Lord. Help to sweet sinner. She feels the rumble of the earth beneath her chest. A whisper of the air ripples across her back. Saints and martyrs. Saint Catherine. Saint Mary. Saint Agnes. Beloved in Christ. Show me a sign. She gazes up at the window at Agnes. Her hair cascades around her, a lamb cradled in her arms. The colours sparkle and slowly Agnes looks round. Mary. Psst. Mary. Above the pulpit, St. Mary of Egypt turns her marble head. What? This girl needs our help. Oh, wait, Catherine. Catherine! Why is it now? The statue of St. Catherine straightens up. My Lady Agnes! You are suffering, child. <laughs> All sufferers oh. suffer in their own way, Catherine. I didn't suffer particularly. Oh, you did, Mary. No, not really, not like you. I read about you, Catherine. They tore apart your flesh as spinning blades. Blades? You don't know half of it. They were like saws, and there were nails in there, too. Although, just to be fair, the angel did destroy the machine before it touched you. Technically, yes. I was but thrown into fire. I thought the fire didn't burn you. Well, it did burn me at first. But then it parted and instead it, well, it burned the pagans watching. I read about that. To be fair, with any kind of torture, I think it's 99% anticipation. Oh, I never know what I think about the pagans being burned anyway. No, I know what you mean. But at the end of the day, miracle's a miracle. When the angel destroyed the machine, it took 400 pagans with it. Good riddance, Theologically I speaking, say. I think it deprived them of a chance of repentance. <laughs> Don't you start me on theology. The Emperor Maxentius summoned his 50 wisest men to try and make me doubt my faith. They couldn't do it. We know, Catherine. In fact, I converted them. And sent them to their deaths. Their blood was their baptism, which they understood. I hope you're not getting qualms at this no late. No one's criticising well, you, Catherine. Actually. This girl needs our <sighs> guidance. Of course. What is your name, child? Oh, Angelique. What ails you, Angelique? I need to know. Is it wrong to love? Ah. Oh. That old chestnut. No, Angelique. It's not wrong to love. The love of God, for example, the love of providence and of grace. These are loves that could never be described well, as... let's not jump to well, any conclusion. Uh, you know, you just let me In general terms, all things being the equal. The love of providence can so easily be confused with the love of what is provided. Which therefore isn't, in fact, providence. So, my it's point still stands. It's a moral, not merely linguistic distinction. Is it wrong to love a man? I love many men. Many men love me. <laughs> love is a nice way of putting it. Yes, all right, I was a whore. I can say that now. It's true, she was. Mm -hmm. I obtained passage to Jerusalem by offering my body to the sailors. Pardon they accepted, of, of course. Yes, but Ooh. when I tried to enter the church there, I couldn't. 
Something held me back. Sin? A force... Yeah. Well, yes, sin. Thank you, Catherine, for stating the obvious. Yes, so you. I prayed to the Virgin and promised that I would renounce the world and immediately three silver Ooh, coins... three silver coins. Imagine onto that, the actually. ground beside me. So you bought some bread. Come on, speed it up. And I walked into the desert and I lived there for 47 years. Right. That must have been terrible. I mean, wonderful, but... Oh, so terrible. The first 15 years were the worst. The sun blackened my skin so bad that I couldn't lie still. I slept standing. But thanks to a miracle, the bread that I had bought sustained me for all of those years, which was a blessing. It must have been so extraordinary to know such grace. And then, after 47 years, what should I see coming through the shimmer and the haze of the desert but the figure of a man? Zosimas. A priest. I don't know who was more scared, him or me. But somehow I knew his name, which certainly knocked him for six. You also floated above the ground, which might have helped. Shall we? I told him my story, and he said he would return the next year to give me communion. Though I never take communion, you see. But the point itself. I'm making is with the question I'm asking is, you would let me get a word in, Edgeways, Catherine, please, thank you. The question I'm asking is, did I love that man, the priest, Zosimas? And yes, it was a kind of love that I felt. I believe you can love a man, if by that you are expressing your love of Christ. Well, <laughs> which of course, I'm not sure that 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 I'm not sure that I'm not sure that I'm not So, if it's an expression of devotion to Christ, it is permissible to love a man? Of course, Angelique. Mm. Certainly. Love and be loved, my child. That night, poor, feverish Angelique lies in her bed, shivering with love. Gold threads weave patterns in the air above her head. She knows she may love him. All that is needed is that he comes to her. Merciful Jesus, Son of God, show Lucian the path to love me. And she listens. Beloved Christ, who loves the world, send me a sign and spare my heart. And she listens. Dear Lord, your humble servant asks only. Angelique listens and she hears. Not footsteps on the stairs on the right side of her bed, but footsteps on the left. Beyond the balcony, footsteps in the air. Because sometimes it can seem that if you pray for something hard enough, you came, then it shall be given. Felician, my love, I prayed you would come, and you have come. And as the boy steps across the cloudy floor towards her, Angelique lifts her head and offers her lips to be kissed. And there, in that room, all alone in that room, Angelique gives herself to him. My darling. As the first light creeps into the balcony window Felicia is gone almost as if he was never there each day Angelique works in a fever of activity Sixteen hours a day, she dances the needles through the silk, the designs growing under her fingers as if by themselves. Once a day, she would feel the bishop's boy at her shoulder, watching over her. Although he said nothing, Angelique knew from his silence that he loved her. And as each day passed, she knew that she loved him too. On the day of the procession, 
The crowds line the streets to watch the boys and girls of the town, the priests and heads of the charities, make their way towards the cathedral. At the head, the bishop, wearing a mitre so intricate, so luminous, that the crowds are captivated. Look, Mama! It's very beautiful, Angelique. No, I meant look. That's Felician. Oh, yes. So it is. I'm going to marry him. What do you mean, Angelique? Don't be cross, Mama. Of course, I I'm not cross. But what do you mean? Felician, he came to me and asked me to marry him. Don't be silly, Angelique. I'm not. When? A week ago. Where? In my room. Angelique, you know perfectly well. Felician has never visited the house. Yes, he has. No, he hasn't. The bishop doesn't let him be on the cathedral grounds. He comes to us every day to inspect the work. No, he doesn't, darling. He does. He comes to the house. Stop this now. And I'm going to marry him. Angelique, I'm taking you to see the nurse tomorrow morning. Why? There's nothing wrong with me. You've never shaken off that fever. Look at you. You're burning up. Aren't you happy for me, Mama? Just stop this. Stop this right now. Mama. You're scaring me. It's nothing to be scared of. It's a miracle, that's all. Oh, don't you leak. You told me love was an illusion. But it isn't. It's really happened. The bishop's boy loves me. Love is a miracle, Mama. Miracles don't happen. Not anymore. Not ever. This is the world we have. No, Mama. Miracles do happen. The world is a miracle all around us. These crowds are a miracle. That tree is a miracle. This flower is a miracle. Please. My love is a miracle. Please stop. Don't cry, Mama. I'm happy. I'll always be happy. Angelique. Didi, is that you? It's me. What's happening? Why is Mama crying? She's crying because she loves you. Tell her she doesn't need to cry. Tell her Felicia will make me very happy. Love is making you ill. Tell her she must only love another to make herself the vessel of the Lord. I'm not going to tell her that, dear girl. I'm lucky. I'm filled with the love of God. You are filled with fever, Angelique. Can we do anything for her? It's not just the fever. It's something deeper. It's in her blood. What do you mean? Mrs. Dillon, you must prepare yourself. This is not the fever. This child is dying. What did she say? Nothing. Don't trouble yourself. Who's dying? No one, my love. Get some rest. Oh, there he is. Who? My love. My true love. Where'd you see him? He's standing over me, looking after me. Poor girl, poor sweet girl. Is there nothing we can do? Make her comfortable. Keep her temperature down. What's the matter, Mama? I can't bear to lose you, my darling. Don't be sad, Mama. I'll come back and see you when I'm married. My sweet love. My darling, precious girl. Today is Angelique's wedding day. All of Beaumont has turned out. There are flags tied to the street lamps, and everyone is in their very best. This is the most important day in every girl's life, she thinks. And in her beautiful nightshirt, and with exquisite cloth slippers on her feet, she makes her way out into the cold. It's a good thing I live right next to the cathedral, she thinks. Slipping a little in the snow. It's cold on my skin, and yet my head is burning with love. She falls in the snow and weakly manages to lift herself up. 
It would have been nice to have a father give me away. She thinks. But perhaps it's better this way. I give myself to Felician as I give myself to Christ. At last, she reaches the cathedral door. Where? Where do I enter? That's funny. We really should have had a rehearsal. I don't want to go in too early. But then I don't want to be too late. Although I know that Felician will love me wherever I come to him. Please, my daughter, my Should girl, I knock? My but I can hardly feel my hands. Come to me. Or my legs. What's wrong with my legs? <laughs> Dreams are not fantasies. Help me. Help me! Dreams are survival. I'm here. It's me. Your mother. Mama? You poor girl, you poor, poor girl. Please! Help us! Mama, it's my wedding day. You came. Someone help us! If you pray for something hard enough... It's my daughter! She's dying! It shall be given. Where is he? Where are you, my love? And through her watery gaze, she sees him. Felicia and her love looking down at her. I will always be with you. I give myself to you. Come, take me with a kiss. And she reaches out to touch her love, but her poor fingers grasp only air. Felicia? Angelique's eyes grow pale and are now still. Her lips whiten as her little heart slows and slows. The snow falls around her until she seems to fade into it, her pale face lost in the white. The first girl of my family whose heart is stopped by love. And not the last, oh no, not the last. But above her, the door groans and the great cathedral, with its heavy, mournful bell, sighs for a soul lost. And around her, the streets of Beaumont, and beyond that, knowing nothing of this girl, the factories burning in their hearts breathe songs of smoke and sadness from their tall chimneys out into the empty sky. was played by Glenda Jackson, Renee and St. Mary by Anna Maxwell Martin, Angelique by Robin Skeet, Ubertine and St. Agnes by Mina Anwar, The Nurse and St. Catherine by Yusra Wasama, and The Girl by the Stream by Lucy Moss. Lovesick was dramatized by Dan Rebellato from the works of Emil Zola and produced by Polly Thomas. It was a Sparklab production for BBC Radio 4.